Good day, everyone. My name is Rick McComas. I'm the regional parts sales manager at um, TerraSource Global uh, Appalachian Warehouse in uh, Catlinsburg, Kentucky. And with me today is uh, Keith Patterson. Keith's here um, in Duncan, South Carolina, um, the parts manager uh, for customer service inside. We're, we're going to start with the NF electromechanical feeders as, as our uh, presentation. Slide set uh, webinar series today. There's two other another in the family of feeders, electromechan uh, electromagnetic, and then the, uh, twin, the twin motor mass feeders. So, what we're going to focus on today is the NF electromechanical feeders. First thing you do when you're doing any maintenance is to first lock and tag out, lock out your power on going to the motor, and then um, also lock out your conveyor belt as well, so that while you're working on the machine, that nothing can happen. There's several maintenance factors to consider when you uh, when you come up with a maintenance plan for any uh, NF feeder. Uh, one of them is frequency of severe frequency and severity of service, and of course the material handled, uh, environmental conditions, and whatever company maintenance practices that you employ now, you have to take those into consideration too. And, and manpower is another one uh, nowadays that some folks overlook. New feeders stretch and set in period. Uh, once one's set in and then begin operation, uh, inspect the feeder twice per eight hour period. Uh, this gives you a chance to take a look at anything that might pop up, especially that you might have some fatigue uh, in the metal or something that's around supporting it uh, that would cause it to destroke or something like that. Uh, it's a good idea to keep it on, keep a good eye on it during its first uh, three or four days, especially a couple times in an eight hour period. Uh, again, check the uh, material buildup on the feeder deck and monitor motor and eccentric shaft bearing temperature and check all bolts and screws for tightness. Um, when you shut it down, of course, that's when you do that. But if you start to hear noises that, that like rattling and other things touching, uh, shut the machine down and, and give it a good look to see if you can locate those uh, items making the noise. Daily inspections, um, you check for material buildup on the deck and under the feeder. You, you'll see here that this is one of the main, main uh, culprits in causing the feeder to act up, and that is goes into a destroke mode. Depending on the stickiness and tack, tackiness of the uh, feeder or the product on the feeder, it could get buildup between the deck and then the, the pan and then start to destroke. So it's a good idea to continually check that, especially um, if you're getting into, into moist content. And here it says, listen for abnormal noises. We talked about that just a minute ago. And always put your uh, stroke indicator in a position where you can take and see what your stroke is, see if it's staying true. Uh, check all guards and covers. Uh, that would be the back motor cover uh, where you're driving eccentric uh, exciter boxes are. This is a, a, a example of a mechanical interference between the feeder and the deck discharge hopper. You can see that that would cause one to uh, go into destruct mode right there. There's other examples. I mean, there, it just that's one I figured I'd show you that I had. Another culprit that we seem to overlook, especially in feeders, are lubrication points and the intervals of the lubrication. You only have the two bearings that are on the exciter box, and that's the eccentric bearings. Jeff Rader specifies that you lubricate these eccentric bearings every 500 operating hours. But the electric motor bearings are something that you know gets overlooked quite a bit, but we recommend checking it two to six months, depending on the motor manufacturer and the recommendations. Again, all these steps and procedures and the type of grease that you would use are in every uh, manual that we sell with the feeders. Checking vibration amplitude. Every Jeffrey feeder, NF feeder is specifically designed and tuned as customer application. That means your tons per hour, moisture content, and the great ability to cold. So once that is derived at and, and it's pinpointed for the application that it goes, that's when the uh, feeder is designed to tune to that specific application. And every unit will have a serial number that gives you the, amp the maximum vibration amplitude specified. Uh, 
the location of the stroke indicator is mounted on the drive plates under the deck. And it's usually it's the, the, when they get put in there, it's the one that you can't get to so very easily. This is just an example of the, of the model number and the serial number of the, of the deck in there. You can see this is a 516 stroke, 5 horsepower. It's got the size of the deck and then the type, NF4808, and then the serial number. And next to it, you'll find the stroke measurement. Uh, the previous slide showed that it says it's 516 stroke. This, this slide shows the 516 where the two circles are just touching. That is where the stroke of that particular NF4808 needs to be. If it's anything else, you've got, you've got a problem. You, you, and you'll probably know it in your production if it's not going correctly. Now, the exciter box, um, that's where the cog motor belt inspection, um, well, cog, the cog motor belt is. To inspect it, you need to take the uh, rear drive cover off from the exciter box, and then you check your tension at mid-span of the belt. This particular uh, timing belt requires a three and a half pound at mid-span of the belt, which is equal to about exactly three sixteenths of a de of deflection of the belt, so that will get your proper tension. And you also have to take into consideration the four points of contact of those two timing sprockets. A lot, of, oftentimes, we work on these, and uh, we don't get that alignment just so correctly and then we're back in there again because the belt's tracked off the uh, off the pulleys and split itself in two. It's pretty it's really important that you get that deflection right and certainly get those uh, four points of contact across the face of the of the timing sprockets. This is an example of this if you look into the NF feeder box components, you'll see the motor and then the motor sh the, uh, the drip the driver shiv. That's uh if you can see well enough that four points of contact is either side of the, the sprockets. You can take a straight edge or a ruler or whatever you might have available to you and see that you have that, that straight edge or ruler will contact that at four spots across the face of the flanges. And the exciter box component sitting here, you see the uh, springs with these rods coming out of them. This is important that on the next slide that when you go to change these springs, if you ever have to change the springs, to get to those rods, you have to take this motor out of the exciter box uh, to get access to those bolts that are in there holding those uh, connecting rods together. This is a cog, the cog belt replacement. They say that the, the cog belt should never require servicing other than occasional check for tension and unusual damage, which is which is true. But you get into a situation oftentimes where the sprockets just wear. I know we have a problem with these in, in the area where uh, my customers mainly are. It, it, we, the coal dust gets in there and just eats the sprockets up, and then you get uh, the teeth will jump on the sprocket. So we do replace some, uh, some sprockets and belts uh, quite a bit in coal fields of uh, West Virginia. And it is recommended that the belt be replaced at the same time the motor or repairs are made if you have to make any motor repairs. Uh, when necessary, follow steps outlined in the NF vibrating feeder manual. Again, everything that we talked about is in the manual that comes along with the feeder. The bearings of the vibrating feeder are heavy duty, specifically selected for the severe operating conditions of the exciter box. The re review the NF vibrating feeder shaft bearing replacement. It's um, it's not a really difficult thing to do, but you still have it, uh, you have to take that exciter shaft out of there. It's just time consuming, um, and again, make sure that you got access to the exciter box, and that every the clear pathway to get in there to, to work on it in a safe situation. We have some places in underground applications where we've actually had to build scaffolding to get to the exciter boxes to get uh, the eccentric shaft changed. Mechanical NF feeders. Again, this is an, an, a better picture of the electric motor, the eccentric shaft, and the timing belt. And here you'll see on this slide um, where the cup that holds the uh, retainer of the spring and that connects the uh, exciter box to the deck of the feeder. One thing I want to point out, if you ever have to change these springs, make sure you decompress that spring first, and that is by going to the 
under the pan and uh, releasing this, the tension on the springs by taking the bolt loose a couple threads and reducing the spring on, tension on both sides of the springs. And this is where I was going back to the point a while ago about to get to these uh, springs that are on the exciter, inside the exciter box, you have to take that motor out and you have to take that eccentric shaft out to get those back bolts out of that machine. It, uh, it's, it's not that hard to do, it just it takes a little time to get it done. And th these bolts are torqued to 500 foot-pounds on the, on the uh, coupling springs. Deck wear line replacement. This is a visual thing that you can do when the deck's not loaded. You can pretty much tell if your product is not scooting off the pan quick enough um, and your stroke is going really well and you have no vibrating noises, it might be that your deck liner needs to be replaced. Uh, one thing that's overlooked a lot is that you know, we get a lot of questions from time to time, can we make this out of a, out of a 3 8 plate rather than a 5 16 go up a little heavier in the deck liner? That's a no-no because your, your stroke it's changed completely. It, it, it affects the performance of the feeder. Never weld liners to the deck. I see that sometimes too. I always use the proper fasteners to attach the liners to the deck. This is a picture of um, a deck liner on a twin mat on a twin motor feeder. Um, and this, if you can take a look at that, you'll see that this comes in two pieces. We can also split these liners into four, to, to in a lot of cases, to make it easier to maintain them to get them in there. Remove the damage stabilizer bar, inspect all fasteners for damage and replace as necessary, inspect the shims and replace as necessary, and be sure to install a shim on each side of each stabilizer bar at both attachment locations. There are occasionally we have some folks who uh, buy the stabilizer bars and forget to put the shims in there, and then that becomes a whole new set of problems. Um, when I sell the stabilizer bars, if I'm working, I, I just, as a rule, take all the hardware and replace it as, along with the shims as well because nothing like going out to the job site and not having everything you need to, to finish it while you're there the first time. This is an example of safety cables on a typical feeder. And, and I'm only going to talk about the safety cables and the stabilizer bars. This is this some who may not know what a stabilizer bar is. This, uh, this is a stabilizer bar right here. There's, there's actually four points where the stabilizer bar comes down from the feeder and, hex, and supports the exciter box. And uh, these safety cables are there just in case that something happens and these springs break loose or, or metal fatigues and breaks out to, so that it does, the feeder doesn't hit the floor. And these areas here, this is, feeder has been installed a little bit incorrectly. It's not at the right angle of the, of the support springs, but in this application that's all they had to work with and it's doing exactly what they want it to do. It's not ideal. And the coupling spring replacement, we talked about that a moment ago, but the pre compressed force must be released by force loosening the bolt at the deck and then cat spring. Remove the cover from the exciter box for access to spring guide rod bolts attached to the exciter box. And when you're comparing your springs, you lay them on side by side just to check for compression and that you're getting the right spring on there. And they must measure within a sixteenth of each other before you install them. And, th and there's just a picture for your words, the coil spring replacement. The proper feed of materials. This pays, plays a big part in the performance of the feeder, and this is something that should have been done when the feeder is installed, but we oftentimes get called out to where a feeder is not performing like it should because they've gone in on the weekend and welded some skirt board or something around it. But these are some things we need to point out about the proper feed. Proper hopper design is essential to efficient feeder operation. And of course, improper design can greatly reduce the feeder capacity. Adjustable gates should be furnished to maintain an adequate flow of material, which in our marketplace we rarely see one. It, the, the feeder just gets the whole uh, blade pushed on the top of it. They hold up really well. And maintain the adequate clearance between the hopper skirts and the feeder deck. That's another thing that can destruct your unit. 
and there's a picture of what I'm set, trying to talk about. This is a feeder chute. Uh, this is a hopper deck that's uh, the little gap that's between the side of the feeder that needs to be cleared, and that's one of the points of uh, three eighths of an inch to five sixteenths of an inch. That, that sometimes that material will get wet and sticky, and it'll get up and, and touch the deck pan inside that uh, liner, and it'll destruct your machine in a heartbeat. Now, this is just some proper uh, hopper design characteristics that every feeder that we do will come with this type of a drawing uh, once you've decided that you're going to go with the generator feeder. These are pretty much design flows that, that's characteristic to every feeder we put out there. And the, when we sell the feeder, it also has uh, the exact recommendations from, from the engineering that this feeder should see. And then again, there's another hopper guideline, recommended hopper configuration designs, throat opening, and that type of thing. And we, all this information is given to you before we even talk about uh, sizing up a feeder. And here's the hopper width is, is relatively important as well. And then the skirting should be uh, rubber, not touching any part of the deck. If, if you do that, then it, it will also destroke it too. The skirt should have a half inch clearance from each side wall of the feeder. That's the main thing. We get a lot of folks that uh, try to keep the product from falling off, and then they'll have the skirting material touch the side of the deck, and that just uh, causes some problems in startup as well. A uh, hopper burden load. This is uh, when you start the feeder up. If you, got, uh, if you don't have a gauge in there to uh, meter the flow to the product, but but again, when we get in uh, a lot of my area, we don't have those. Uh, we deal with the, a lot of the hopper bird loads because we don't have uh, gates there. Well, I know that was quick. Thank you very much. Does anybody have questions? Marlon would like you to address things to consider when using these feeders in hot, warm, cold, and extreme cold temperatures. I'll let Keith handle that. That's, that's an application data thing that uh, engineering should answer. Okay, as far as uh, operating in, in cold temperatures, um, the thing, you've got two issues uh, to deal with. One, if you have uh, frozen material, uh, you, that can lead to uh, reduction in capacity due to the uh, frozen material uh, resisting getting out of the hopper to the feeder pan. The other issue uh, to deal with in extremely cold temperatures is the lubrication of the bearings. Uh, if the uh, lubrication is too thick, you may not have adequate uh, film lubrication uh, thickness at the bearing level, and you may find that in the wintertime you need to go to a slightly lower viscosity oil or grease for those bearings. Uh, if you're up in the in the northern part of Canada or in the uh, tundra uh, where it doesn't uh, get up above freezing uh, in the course of the day. As far as operating in hot temperatures, uh, feeders usually don't have too much issue with uh, operating in high ambient temperature. Uh, as far as an ambient standpoint, uh, the feeders can operate up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, without any issue at all. We do take special precaution if your material is at a high temperature, uh, like at three or 400 degrees Fahrenheit material that you're processing, uh, then we may go to special alloys for the deck and liners, uh, and also uh, possibly set up some force ventilation or other issues that have to be uh, considered on an application-to-application -application basis.